so for my family, we were always celebrating Christmas all throughout the weeks before Christmas with our church family. That was really family to us. And so we did this thing called caroling, which we would split up and go to every home in our church that was in that city. And so we would go to like 15 homes in one night and we'd go at every house and we'd sing to the top of our lungs. We'd dance, we'd have tambourines, uncles would have drums, we'd be beating it. Everyone would be praising the Lord. And it was really beautiful because we grew up in a very traditional church and so to see our parents come alive in that way was just such a beautiful expression of our Indian culture. So I'm curious like how was music a part of y'all's family culture? Yeah so for us growing up uh, we did this thing called Posadas and it really commemorates Mary and Joseph's journey um, and we would go house to house when they were looking for shelter. We would go house to house with my family um, and it would like be throughout the neighborhood. And we would sing a song that was saying like, hi, we're looking for shelter. Um, just to, someone would play Mary, someone would play Joseph sometimes. And uh, the last house that we would stop at that would let us open the door, they had a little song to sing when they opened the door. And uh, we would just, go in and then we would pray the rosario, which which is the rosary. Um, we had a whole prayer to the rosary. And so after that, we would just eat food and like dance and eat, yeah, eat a lot of food. So music is when we went to the posada, like we would sing to every house we knocked. And then the person that answered, that would say, no, we can't let you in or we're letting you in. They would sing and also we would sing throughout um, the prayers of the rosary. So we would sing a lot. <laughs> yeah. Actually, for us in, in, in Chihuahua, we did that kind of a different way. So the place where I come from is this little town in the middle of the mountains, and it's like 400 people. But we used to have a mass on the 24th, and on the 25th, in the afternoon of the 25th, we got together. Uh, the church was in the in the center of the town because they believed that uh, everybody should be equally close to God, so they put the church in it. And it's magical because uh, it has this amazing acoustics. When you got to go far, 400 people in there and they all sing, all of a sudden it sounds like the mountains are singing and that was, that's the sound of Christmas to me. I've loved hearing how different cultures around the world celebrate Christmas, and I, I don't know about you, but have you ever tried going caroling in South Austin? It, it doesn't work uh, nearly as well. Uh, in fact, I remember one of the first years we were here, our life group went across the street to start singing to my neighbors over there in Barton Hills, and uh, if there had been a song, remember how she said there's a song we sing, uh, there's no room for you here? She was giving us a stare like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, and that song just kept going. Like I just, I thought, well, how can you end this short? You know, it was rough, all right? But you know, typically music is an international language. Like music is transcendent. And throughout human history, in every part of the world, music can be such a powerful thing. Across cultures, it, it becomes like the soundtrack of important moments in our life. It can underscore some of the most reflective times in our life and it seems to express our feelings and emotions better than anything else can i even wonder if there's something about the way that we were created by god that we that we want to create music and song it's like deeply ingrained within us almost as if it's part of the image of god that we might reflect worship to the one who created us i don't know about you but when do you start playing your Christmas music? All right, for some of you, it was November 1st. Like, as soon as Halloween's over, you're, you're doing it. Some of you, you wait till, like, right after dessert, Thanksgiving. And some of you are like, oh, wait, it's this week? I haven't even bought anything, right? And somewhere in between. But to me, in some ways, Christmas music is, is almost like a reminder of the spiritual reality as described in Psalm 148, that all of creation sings God's praises. And you and I can join in that chorus with our own song when we really encounter God this Christmas season. See, all of creation sings God's praises, and we can too. 
And the challenge is it can be so busy this time of year. I, I don't know about you, but I'm okay with saying no to another Christmas party. I, I had three this week. And I have a couple more coming this next week. And it's wonderful to celebrate and get together. But, but sometimes it can be so busy this time of year that you don't have time to even consider what's really most important. Maybe we could say no to just one of those ugly Christmas sweater parties. <laughs> and spend that evening or other time that you set aside to connect your heart with God. You know, to do that, maybe it's just going on a walk. I mean, we've had such beautiful weather. Just go into the green belt and on your walk, just praying. Or maybe it's spending time in the scriptures. Maybe it's reading the Christmas story in the Gospels. Or maybe you're not sure about God. Why don't you start reading the Gospel of John? He's written it, it says, specifically to help those who don't believe. And just pray, God, if you're real, show me who you are. Or maybe it's journaling, writing down some of the ways you've seen God work in your life, or maybe it's reflecting, meditating on God's goodness and ways to be grateful, or maybe it's even singing worship songs. Some of you know my story. I, uh, singing was never really a, like a, a love language for me. It's, it's one of those things that I kind of would tolerate in order to get to the message. That's what I really liked on Sunday mornings. But a few years ago, I, I really just asked God, help me to connect in a different way with you. You see, my wife's personality is, is one described as she lives in her feelings. In my personality, it says they deny feelings exist. <laughs> and so as I went through recovery, I, I felt for the first time my head and my heart connected. And it was in that season that worship, even singing on Sundays, suddenly the, the lyrics became more real to me. See, worship is what happens when we realize who God is and what he's done for us. So what if we were to quiet some things down and in the midst of that quiet, better hear God's still small voice reminding us of his presence in the ordinary moments. You know, the, the Psalms are filled with songs written by those who experience God. And one of the most prolific of the writers is a, a man named David who became king. But before that, he was a shepherd, he was a musician, he was a poet, and later a warrior. But he was such a great musician, apparently, that he was able to calm the crazy King Saul, as depicted here in this painting by Rembrandt. But he wrote these words in Psalm 108. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. I can just imagine David waking up with just a song in his heart, just overwhelmed with gratitude and just singing at the top of his lungs, maybe waking up those around him with this song. Whether it's the portrait of Rembrandt by Rembrandt or the song of David, according to the scriptures, these responses are not actually exceptional, as beautiful as they are. They're actually appropriate because all of creation exists to praise its creator. Psalm 98 says it this way, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Or this one in Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. See, all of creation was intentionally crafted in a beautiful order that God deemed good. And the majesty and the glory of our creator is shown through his creation. I mean, this weather just this week has been just so gorgeous. I hope you've been outside. If not, you better get out there quick because it's going to get cold. But it's just so amazing to be outside 
clear skies and 60 degrees. You're not sweating when you just open your car door. And there are no mosquitoes. Just the glory of creation. You know, yesterday we were indoors for about four hours watching the movie Avatar. It's the new film, The Way of Water. And there's a storyline about this very intelligent whale-type creature, which reminded me of the documentary on Disney Plus called The Secrets of Whales. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it's fascinating. Did you know that humpback whales sing? And their songs can be heard for 10,000 miles. Now, only the males sing, and for years, scientists thought it must be a, a way to seduce a mate, but there's not enough evidence to say that for sure. But just as a quick aside, could you imagine if guys we had to sing in order to get a girl? <laughs> a lot of us would never find one, right? <laughs> but there's a lot we don't know about the humpback whales, but there's some amazing things we do. Not only can their songs be heard for 10,000 miles, but whenever a whale, two male whales get close to each other, they actually start to change their tune to match, almost like a, a duet. And some humpback whales who aren't family actually traverse thousands of miles in order to gather together in the same location every time of the same time of the year, singing their songs together. It's like a tradition. It's just one example of the trillions of ways that creation sings God's praises. It drives point a home that Jesus uh, uh, drives home a point that Jesus made when he marched into Jerusalem the week before the crucifixion and people were singing and praising him dancing at his entry into the city here's the Messiah to rescue us they thought he was coming to rescue them politically they didn't fully understand the story but there was something the religious leaders understood they were losing their influence and they were mad and so it tells us in Luke 19 that some of the Pharisees, these religious leaders in the crowd, said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples for singing and dancing as you entered the city. And Jesus said this, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. He's not talking about the rolling stones. <laughs> He's saying the rocks will cry out. It's as if he was saying that you don't understand. I am the creator in flesh and bone. And whether you like it or not, all of creation was designed to worship me. Have you ever seen the beauty of creation and just been so in awe of the one who created all this? I shared this story a while back, but in the midst of grieving the loss of my father who died in September, I asked God for just a sense of peace and hope in life beyond this life. And I got to my parents' house where they've lived the last 12 years. It's an old 50-year-old house that they inherited from my grandmother. And I saw this image and I took a picture. Just was overwhelmed with how beautiful it was. There on the lake, Lake LBJ with the rain in the distance. Just a glimpse of how beautiful creation is. How remarkable the creator must be. Have you seen... The telescope, James Webb telescope images, considered the greatest scientific breakthrough this year. If you haven't seen them, go online and look. You will be amazed looking at these galaxies so far away. And yet a God who can create a universe so vast and so beautiful is not far away. The story of Christmas is that he came and walked among us. That he actually created you and me that we might have relationships with him. In these psalms, we're just hearing the story, the journal entries of others who were overwhelmed with the goodness of God and could not help but worship. Psalm 96 says it this way, let heaven celebrate, let the earth rejoice, let the sea and everything in it roar, let the countryside and everything in it celebrate. Then all the trees of the forest too will shout out joyfully before the Lord because he is coming. He is coming to establish justice on the earth. He will establish justice in the world rightly. He will establish justice among all people fairly. See, from the very beginning of the scriptures, we see the, the story of a God who would come to rescue us. 
Jesus was not some sort of plan B. Whoops, things didn't work out. So I got to go down and fix it. Instead, from the very beginning, Genesis 3 tells us, after Adam and Eve had chosen to go their own way, tempted by darkness, the scriptures promised that one day there would be a snake crusher to destroy evil. And throughout the Hebrew scriptures, you just see song after song, poem after poem, prophecy after prophecy, proclaiming the truth that one day there will be someone to come and rescue us. Isaiah 55, the Messianic Psalms like chapter 2 and chapter 22 and 110, or this one in Psalm 98 says this, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. By the way, do you see that word salvation? In Hebrew, it's the word Yeshua. That's the name of Jesus. Yeshua, transliterated into English, we say it, Jesus. That means in the Hebrew scriptures, over and over and over, they saw the name Yeshua, 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 pointing towards the one who would come to save us. It continues, let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. See, in this wicked and evil world, one day God will make all things right. And the path towards making all things right was by coming to us on that Christmas day. So it would make sense if all the Hebrew scriptures were singing of this one who was to come, that when Jesus arrived, there would be lots of songs. In fact, it tells us when Mary was pregnant, she went to visit her cousin who was also pregnant, another miracle baby, who would come to be known as John the Baptist. And in that moment, these two pregnant women came together, and John leapt with excitement in his mother's womb. And so that's why every time I see two pregnant women talking to each other, I always have to ask, did one of your babies jump? And they never think it's funny for some reason. I'm not sure why. It's an inside joke, right? Have you ever jumped for joy? Have you ever had a moment where you were just so excited you couldn't contain yourself? Maybe this, for some of us, feels like a silly question. I mean, that's what children do at Christmas morning. Maybe you become too cynical, too jaded in life, seem too much. What if you and I could catch a glimpse of that kind of joy to know that we are not alone? I remember someone asking Irwin, a pastor I worked with for 12 years in Los Angeles, why do you follow Jesus? I mean, there's so many different ways to believe. There's so many different religions. I mean, can't you just believe in any of them? Just believe it sincerely. Like, why would you choose Jesus? And I'll never forget his answer. He said, because Jesus is the only one coming for us. No one else is coming for us, but Jesus came for us. There's another part of the story when Mary, so overwhelmed with God's goodness, burst out in song. Just singing out of gratitude for all the good things that God is doing. Some of the words included, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Or then the angels, it tells us, when they showed up to the shepherds, they saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. If you're not the type to jump for joy or to break out in song, what would it take to make that happen in your life? See, in this third week of Advent, Advent simply is a Latin word for the anticipation or the, the coming of the promised one. It seems appropriate to ask, is there anything joyful enough that it might help you break through the cynicism of our culture? 
any good news that might shift your perspective and fill your heart with such joy and hope despite your circumstances that you might just be moved to express your gratitude in some sort of way. See, when we fully understand the beauty of the Christmas story, that God came to rescue us, becoming a baby, growing up to live a perfect life, to teach with authority, to befriend the outcast, to bring healing to the sick, and ultimately willingly taking on evil, dying on a cross. But he did not stay in that tomb. On the third day, he rose to new life, promising that life for every one of us who chooses to follow him. You see, the beauty of the story is that it's real. Jesus is alive. We can experience him even now. See, worship is what happens when you realize who God is and what he's done for you. And by the way, singing is the easiest type of worship. That's the easiest. It's easy to come on a Sunday and sing along with the band. By the way, I like to think of these as the best backup singers for me that I've ever had. <laughs> right? Just sing out. Or in the car, it's easy to sing. Singing is easy. That's the easiest way to worship. But the idea of worship is bigger than just singing. Listen to what Paul describes worship as in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, when we fully understand the miracle of Christmas and the power of the resurrection of Jesus, our only response is to willingly lay down our lives to follow him. Not only do we sing or jump for joy, but we seek to overcome the sins and struggles that slow us down. We willingly give up of our finances, our time, our energy, our expertise. Think about it this way. What is the price you would pay for peace? How much would you pay to see someone you love experience a changed heart? How much would you quantify the value of unconditional love. So you know, when we give our finances, our time, our energy, our expertise to God's work through the local church, we're actually investing in peace and love and changed hearts and lives. We're making an eternal difference. Have you ever watched the news and been so overwhelmed and just wished there was something you could do? When you invest in God's work through our church, you're actually doing something to make a difference. We've seen children discover faith and build a foundation of understanding God's unconditional love. We've seen teenagers and young adults who are on a dangerous path, both danger to themselves and to others, find community, find forgiveness, and find hope. We've seen singles and couples struggling with the brand new city, feeling isolated and lonely, discover friendships, discover community. And we've seen couples on the brink of divorce find healing. We found seniors, isolated and alone, find purpose and community. So you can't put a dollar amount for what any of these intangibles are worth. You can't limit their value in terms of hours worked but the beauty of giving generously of our finances, our time, our expertise, our energy is the eternal impact we're making. We're bringing more of heaven to earth. And that's why we don't shy away from asking, especially at the end of the year, would you just pray about what God wants you to give, maybe even above and beyond what you normally give. Of course, if you're a guest, feel no obligation to give. Our gift to you is just having you here. But for those of us, our church family, this is our opportunity to consider at the end of the year, God, is there more you want from me? To see the joy of Jesus' birth pierced through the sorrow of a world lost in darkness and chaos. I want to show you this beautiful picture Kenny Green shared with me. It's called Mary Consoling Eve, painted by Grace Remington. I think this beautifully illustrates what's happening. Notice Eve's sorrow and Mary's joy. Notice the snake wrapped around Eve's leg and how Mary is crushing the head of the snake with her foot. Notice how Eve is hanging her head in shame 
naked and exposed, the fruit still in her hand, while her other hand is reaching out and touching Mary's belly, hoping. See, Eve represents us, humanity, deep in sin and shame, longing for someone to rescue us. And Mary cups Eve's cheek in her hand, a knowing look in her eye and a smile that says, it's okay, dry your tears, he's here now. The snake's head crushed under a foot like it's no big deal, joy overcoming sorrow. You know, the songs we sing at Christmas are that much sweeter when we realize what side of history we live in. Because we're also Mary, reaching back in history, rejoicing what God has truly done. He did what he promised. He came to rescue us. We have a reason to sing, a reason to live sacrificial lives. We opened up talking about how music and song communicate something transcendent, how music is the intimation of the inexpressible. It it fills the void that the limitations of language leaves us all with. We say we fill music in our soul because our perception of our soul manifests when it is touched, when it is moved. And since we're in this series, Christmas Around the World, we want to show you how our God is being worshipped in every language and people around the planet. We have friends in Austin who originally came from Eastern African countries at a church called Hope of Life, and they performed at Gateway in North Austin. We wanted to share some of that with you. There's no lyrics, no translation, because we hope you feel this love for Jesus in your soul, because all of creation exists to bring praise to our Creator. Let's watch together. Gateway Church. This is Hope of Life, a present worship team and faith choir. We are here to sing and for you and for our Lord. We are very happy to be here. The song that we're going to sing, it is about how Jesus came on this earth to save us, how wonderful it is for him to give his one and only son. And the traditional dance that we're going to sing, it is a Kinyamulenga traditional uh, dance, but the language is in Kinyaranda. Enjoy the dance.